Welcome to our fifth uh, webinar on the shoulder pathologies regarding the rotator cuff. Uh, this is part of the Dubai Shoulder Course with Association of the Emirates uh, Orthopedic Society. Today I am uh, really honored to announce uh, two um, speakers who will be giving us some very important talks about uh, the rotator cuff today. Uh, the program will start as follows. We will have uh, Dr. Osama Saleh from Dubai UAE starting our talk, followed by Professor Pascal Boileau from Nice, France, who will give us a talk about uh, rotator cuff uh, pathologies and um, delamination of the tendon and his way to re repair the rotator cuff. Dr. Osama, who will kindly talk to us about acromioplasty. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much, Dr. Polo, for accepting our invitation. It's my pleasure today to uh, present in the same session with you. I'm going to talk today to you about how to manage the acromion, what to do for the acromion during the rotator cuff repair. Uh, when I'm looking at any patient with a rotator cuff tear, I'm going to operate on him. I have in my hand either to do anteroinferior acromioplasty or sometimes lateral acromioplasty, or many times just leave it alone. We'll go through my presentation, why the evidence-based medicine behind each one of them, when exactly, what is the indication, and how I do it. Going back to history, Dr. Neer in 1972, he started doing open acromioplasty, and it was a revolution at this time, because before him, it was just acromionectomy. And 14 years later on, Bigliani described the three types of acromion shape and he related this to the incidence of rotator cuff pathology and rotator cuff tear. And if you notice that the type 3 acromion, the hooked acromion, has a high incidence of rotator cuff tear. And because of all of this, the people start believing completely in the subacromion impingement syndrome or what we call it the extrinsic theory meaning that most of the problem for the cuff is coming from outside, either because of the shape of the acromion, could be type three, the orientation or the lateral down sloping, the AC joint uh, osteophyte or prominent spare, or because of the CA ligament, either it is hypertrophied or calcified or a very tight CA ligament. Later on, uh, Dr. Elman take the acromioplasty from the open procedure to an arthroscopic procedure. And since he described the arthroscopic way of, uh, of subacromion decompression, it was a revolution and there is a dramatic increase in the frequency of acromioplasty uh, till the late uh, uh, 90s. And it's been associated as well. It's not only for the painful shoulder, the subacromion uh, impingement, it's because uh, it's also been involved in the treatment of rotator cuff tear. So once you do a rotator cuff repair, it was automatic at that time to do subacromion decompression and acromioplasty because of the belief on the extrinsic theory. But this extrinsic theory uh, didn't last for a long time. By the late 90s, people start thinking about, no, it's not a problem from outside. It's actually the problem coming from inside the cuff itself. It's because of the aging, the degeneration, or uh, due to the extrinsic overload, the vascularity of the tendon, the micro instability, uh, even some genetics or calcification of the tendon itself, and they call it the extrinsic theory. Because of this extrinsic, uh, because of this extra, uh, intrinsic theory, people start asking the logic question. Since it is an extrin uh, intrinsic from inside the tendon, so why we do acromioplasty? And they start doing some research on doing rotator cuff repair without acromioplasty, and the result was a bit promising. But the most interesting studies came as a comparative study. There is, if you go to the literature, you will find five, namely five interesting comparative randomized control trial. They looked at the need for acromioplasty during rotator cuff repair. So they did a group of patients with acromioplasty, rotator cuff repair plus acromioplasty, and the other group is rotator cuff repair without acromioplasty. And you can find these five articles in two uh, systematic review. 
The conclusion for all the systematic reviews and for most of this article that they doesn't support the routine use of acromioplasty and CA ligament during rotator cuff repair. So they said, whatever you do, either acromioplasty or no acromioplasty during rotator cuff repair, the results are the same. But the people who still believe on extrinsic factor and believe that we should do acromioplasty, they can easily criticize all of these articles. All of them, they have a very short uh, follow-up, they less than four or five years. And if you look individually, one of the studies which is done in Canada, Peter McDonald, they show it that he have a higher reoperation rate in the group of no acromioplasty, and they converted them to, acro uh, to another surgery of subacromial decompression and acromioplasty. And if you look again into details, you will find that in the black column, this is the acromioplasty group, the always a bit above, statistically not significant, but never below the outcome of no acromioplasty. Another study which is done in uh, US, they excluded completely type 3 acromion, which is a big question mark. We usually do acromioplasty for type 3 acromion. So he's comparing the two groups in type 2, which yes, we can agree for that. We can do acromioplasty or not. And their follow-up is very short. And because of this five randomized control trial, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery came to the same conclusion. It does not support the routine use of acromioplasty uh, with rotator cuff repair. But the recommendation, if you, if you will see it, it's just moderate uh, recommendation. It's not strong one. So why people still doing it? Why, why are still doing it? Because we still believing on the extrinsic, uh, extrinsic theory. It's or at least there is a mixture of intrinsic and extrinsic one. You cannot exclude one of them. There is a better, uh, you can achieve better viewing, especially in tight shoulder, decrease the contact between the rotator cuff and the acromion uh, after the repair. So you protect your repair a bit and we cannot ignore the biology. The stem cell, which is coming from the acromioplasty side is helping with the uh, rotator cuff healing. In my practice, I do it in a selective way, and I think most of the people, they do the same. When exactly for me is the indication, I have to have the three element together, the clinical picture, radiological, and intraoperative. So in clinical picture, the patient should complain of uh, impingement pain, the site of the pain exactly, the character of the pain. He has a positive impingement sign and positive impingement test. And then confirming this with the radiological finding, if he has a type three acromion, osteophyte, greater tuberosity, cyst, or high critical shoulder angle, we, which, which we will come later on to that. And then finally, if I go inside and confirm all of this intraoperatively, I go ahead and do acromioplasty. Otherwise, there is no indication for me. I avoid it in many patients mainly the patient with massive repairable calf tear and old age with bad tissue quality. This patient, they have a high chance of failure. And if you do acromioplasty and release of the CA ligament in such patient, they will end up like the picture down you see, anterosuperior escape and pseudoparalysis. The massive irreparable calf tear in such patient where he have a good decent function, but his main problem is pain, Usually for this patient, we do subacromian debridement, bicep stenotomy, and partial repair. In this patient particularly as well, don't do acromioplasty and release the CA ligament. And of course, in acute traumatic patient, there is no need uh, for doing such procedure. So how I do it, it's, it's, uh, there is two described technique, either to do it from the lateral viewing posterior, or to do it a cutting block technique, viewing from lateral portal and working from posterior. I usually prefer the cutting block technique because it gives me, it give me a landmark where I know exactly where, where should I go. So you have a flat surface on the posterior uh, surface of the acromion, just follow this flat surface and keep going forward with your shaver until you make, all, uh, you make the whole surface in one line. 
turning the type 3 acromion into type 1 acromion. And I think this is most reproducible way to do the uh, acromioplasty. The second point, what about the lateral acromioplasty? It's a new trend uh, nowadays, and people keep talking about this uh, a lot. So the story started in 2012 when Christian Gerber looked at, a three, uh, looked at actually two types of his patient, patient with rotator cuff tendinopathy, rotator cuff tear, and patient with an osteoarthritis, and compared this two group of patients to asymptomatic normal population. And he found that in a patient with rotator cuff tear, rotator cuff tendinopathy, there is a large acromial coverage, upward tilting of the glenoid, and he measured an angle between this two line and called it the critical shoulder angle. And he found that the patient who had a high critical shoulder angle, they have high tendency to develop rotator cuff tendinopathy and rotator cuff tear. On the other hand, the patient with low critical shoulder angle, they usually get into osteoarthritis of the glenohumeral joint. And people start investigating after that. As again, the same group of Christian Gerber looked at the reproducibility of this uh, critical shoulder angle and compare it with the other parameter on the radiology. He compared it with the acromion index, lateral down sloping of the acromion or acromion angle, and the Bigliani classification. And he found the most relevant to the rotator cuff arthropathy and degeneration is the critical shoulder angle. It's not actually only uh, Christian Gerber. There is a group from Germany. They looked at 1,000 patients as well, and they compared the three parameters, critical shoulder angle, acromion index, lateral acromion angle, and they found the same result. Yes, it is more linked to rotator cuff arthropathy than any other measurements, the critical shoulder angle. That's why when you look at the Bob Med, you will find hundreds of articles looking at the critical shoulder angle. So in conclusion from his study that the critical shoulder, the high critical shoulder angle is usually associated with rotator cuff pathology and the low critical shoulder angle is associated with osteoarthritis of the glenohumeral joint. How we measure this critical shoulder angle? It's by true AB view, the Gracie view. Take a point from the superior glenoid to the inferior glenoid, then another line from the inferior glenoid to the inferior, inferior lateral part of the acromion. The normal angle is between 30 to 35. High angle is more than 35. Low angle is, more, is less than 30. If there is any biomechanical uh, theory for that, sorry, if there is any biomechanical theory for that, yes. They found biomechanically that when you have a high critical shoulder angle, there is more shear force on the glenohumeral joint than compression force. So for this shear force, the, the cuff tendon itself have to do more effort and more strain to stabilize the humeral head again. That's why they get rotator cuff problems. On the other hand, with a low critical shoulder angle, there is more of a compression force on the glenohumeral joint. So the patient get more cartilage damage and osteoarthritis. That's biomechanically, but what about the correlation of this with our clinical practice? There is two important questions we ask uh, for this. If we correct this critical shoulder angle, will it affect the outcome of our calf repair? And the other question, which is easier than the first question, is how we can correct this critical shoulder angle. So looking at the literature in the arthroscopy 2012, there is a multi-center study they look at their cuff repair and they, test, uh, they took an MRI scan six months post-operatively and check which patient have uh, healed cuff, which patient have re -tear. And they found that the critical shoulder angle, if it is more than 38, it increased the re -tear risk almost four folds. Another study, the same concept, 90 patient post-operative MRI scan. The group with a high critical shoulder angle, they have a 15% re-tear rate. The group with a normal critical shoulder angle, zero re-tear rate. A systematic review 2019 last year came exactly with the same result. If you have a high critical shoulder angle, the re-tear rate is high. Low critical shoulder angle or normal critical shoulder angle, I mean, the re-tear rate is 10% only. 
And it's not only the retail rate, it's affecting the strength of the cuff after healing. So again, another study from Christian Gerber, he did a correction of the critical shoulder angle and looked at the patient who had healed cuff. He found that the patient with a critical shoulder angle less than 35 degree, they have 25 stronger cuff. They have 25 stronger abduction in, uh, compared to the patient with uh, uncorrected critical shoulder angle. So the answer of our first question is yes. If you correct the critical shoulder angle, you will decrease the retail rate of the cuff and you will improve the cuff strength. Let's go for question number two. How can we correct this critical shoulder angle? The, line, the first line, which is representing the glenoid uh, version or the glenoid inclination, you cannot play with that. You cannot do glenoid osteotomy, but you can play with this line. If you take a part from the lateral acromion, doing lateral acromioplasty, you will move the line this way and you will end up with normal critical shoulder angle. The question now, shall we go anterolateral or dead lateral? The answer came from the same group in uh, Ziarech by Christian Gerber. He said that the consistent reduction of the critical shoulder angle could be achieved better if you do lateral acromioplasty rather than anterolateral acromioplasty. But guess what? There is two studies coming after that from France, one in 2009 and the other one just this year, 2020. They look at their patient retrospectively and they found that they just did anterolateral acromioplasty and ended up with a correction of the critical shoulder angle. So the conclusion of them that the standardized anterior acromioplasty or anteroinferior acromioplasty will also do the same job and significantly reduce the critical shoulder angle or normalize the high critical shoulder angle. The same came from France as well, the group of Luc Favard, we look at their patients retrospectively and they found that the anterior arthroscopic acromioplasty, again, it significantly reduced the overall critical shoulder angle as well. So because of these two studies, if we go back to the same slide, why we still do anteroinferior acromioplasty, we can add the second line. It does correct the high critical shoulder angle according to the evidence from two centers. So let's go to a case study, how we correct this critical shoulder angle. This is one of our patient, 46 years old, right hand dominant. He had a refractory shoulder pain, positive impingement sign, positive impingement test. He had a supraspinatus fall thickness tear. That's his MRI, lateral down sloping of the acromion. Acromion index is high, fall thickness cuff tear. If you look at the sagittal MRI, you can say it's type two, type three acromion. There is a controversy. And if you look at the critical shoulder angle, which has been measured on the X-ray, AB, and on the MRI, this critical shoulder angle is 39. This is intraoperatively, after doing anteroinferior acromioplasty, reviewing from the, boost, uh, from the lateral border, uh, from the lateral portal, and our acromionizer is coming from posterior in a line with the lateral border of the acromion and start shaving the lateral border of the acromion and doing acrom lateral acromioplasty from posterior the whole way till reaching the anterolateral aspect. You have to be very careful during this procedure not to detach the deltoid. Once you see the white fibers of the deltoid, you have to stop your shaver. How we calculate the amount, the average amount to correct the critical shoulder angle is about five millimeters which is the width of the acromion. It's easy to judge it this way. And finally, that's his X-ray postoperatively with a corrected critical shoulder angle of 32 degree. So finally, my take home message from the presentation that your anteroinferior acromioplasty shouldn't be routinely in all cases of rotator cuff repair. You should be selective based on the clinical finding the X-ray and the intraoperative finding. It is very important to preserve the CA ligaments and avoid acromioplasty in patients with massive cuff tear, either they are repairable cuff tear or irreparable cuff tear. 
Try to measure the critical shoulder angle in every degenerative cuff tear before going to the surgery with a true AB. And if you correct the critical shoulder angle, you will end up with a stronger cuff and you will decrease the re-tear rate. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Osama, for this very informative talk on uh, chromioplasty and when to do and when not to do. We will now move to Professor Boileau, who will talk to us about uh, delamination of rotator cuff tendon and how he manages it. So please, if you can share your screen. First of all, thank you very much for your uh, invitation. It's a, it's a great honor for me. It's a privilege to be uh, uh, able to uh, share my knowledge with, uh, with you. Uh, uh, thank you to Usama uh, for his invitation. Thank you to Ali for the, his very kind introduction. I think uh, uh, it's very nice to see that uh, uh, the shoulder surgeons in this uh, area of the world are very active and uh, very productive. So congratulations to, uh, to, to you and uh, thank you very much again for, your, for this invitation. So I, I choose to, to talk about uh, the tendon delamination and the impact of the tendon healing. I think it's an important uh, topic because uh, I've been trying to explore this uh, area here and that's why I, I wanted to share with you my, uh, my knowledge on, on, on this uh, subject. So as you know, tendon retraction is a uh, is well-known pro prognostic factor regarding tendon healing, which means the larger the tear, the less chance of tendon healing you have uh, between a stage one, a small tear, a stage two, a medium tear, and a stage three. I mean, uh, you should uh, hesitate before trying to uh, operate on a stage uh, a three uh, tear. Uh, by the way, uh, the, the, sorry, the tendon delamination is something different. It's different from the tendon retraction. It, it has an impact on the, on the tendon uh, healing. And as you can see, what is tendon delamination? You have a deep layer here and a superficial layer of the, of the cuff uh, tear. And what I would like to share with you in the next minutes is uh, what is it, uh, which means re revisiting the anatomy of the footprint, number one, and the tendon retraction. Number two, what is the impact of this uh, tendon delamination on, on, the, on the tendon healing itself and what it has changed in my uh, practice. So first part, tendon delamination, uh, should we re revisit the anatomy of the footprint? Uh, first of all, uh, this tendon delamination has been underestimated because the rate of uh, delamination in cuff tears, chronic cuff tears, of course, is between 40% uh, and 70%. It's a lot, and uh, we probably underestimate this uh, uh, tendon delamination. As you can see, you have the deep layer here and the superficial layer, which is here, and uh, we should consider this uh, from an histological standpoint, and this is a very old work from uh, Clark and Ariman, where you see that there is mix between the capsule and the tendon of the rotator cuff. We, and uh, on the insertion, you have both the insertion of the, uh, the tendon itself and of the capsule. What is important to understand is uh, that the insertion of the supraspinatus is very small compared to the insertion of the infraspinatus. And in fact, uh, this is uh, uh, when at the beginning of, of my experience, when I was seeing the footprint like this, I was saying, okay, it's a supraspinatus tear. But I was wrong because it's also an infraspinatus tear. And you will see this from the nice uh, work, anatomical work from the Japanese uh, surgeons, Mochizuki, Sugaya, and others. They have shown nicely that the insertion of the supraspinatus is there. This is a bicipital groove here. And the infraspinatus, in fact, is covering the supraspinatus insertion. You see the curve of the infraspinatus here. And this is very, very, under, uh, very, very uh, normal if you think about it. If you want to have some external rotation, you need this tendon to be inserted not only on the lateral part of the great tuberosity, but also on the upper part of the great tuberosity, on the footprint itself. So, 
looking at all this work they have done, we can see that the supraspinatus here is here with a fibrous band here. And this is the, the infraspinatus uh, there. And you can see that in some patients, the supraspinatus even insert on the uh, lesser tuberosity here. And what happened is that, uh, in fact, the uh, infraspinatus is covering, coming above the infraspinatus, uh, supraspinatus insertion. So there, there is a kind of mix of the, of the tendon layers. And if we look here on this preparation of this uh, anatomical preparation, you can see that uh, the, there is both insertion of the cuff tendon itself and of the uh, capsule, and there is a retraction. And also here you can see the start of the delamination of the tendon here. It's well seen here in this area where you see the capsule here, you see the tendon here, and you see the space because it needs to slide all together for the function of the shoulder, for the normal physiology of the shoulder. It is well seen on the uh, uh, histologic preparation here, where you can see that in the normal cuff, there is a space between the capsule and the tendon. And of course, when you have a tendon here, this uh, space is different. So here is the footprint here. And here you see that uh, you have insertion of the supraspinatus, you have insertion of the capsule anteriorly, you have insertion of the infraspinatus, which is covering the supraspinatus, and then you have insertion of the capsule here. So altogether, it makes what has been well known as the rotator cable described by Steve Burkhardt here. And you see that there is a crescent here, and this is all the capsule, but it's, it's a mixed structure with, with the tendon itself. But more importantly, what you have to realize is that the direction of the retraction of the tendon of the infraspinatus is not medial, is posterior and medial. And this is very important to understand because it means that when you have a curved tear like this, there are two different retraction tendons of tendons that you have to manage. The retraction of the supraspinatus is medial. There is no discussion about that. And it's even medial and anterior around the, uh, around the base of the coracoid. So the base of the coracoid is like a, a mooring pile and the tendon is retracted uh, uh, around the mooring pile here with the coracohumeral ligament here. While the infraspinatus, as you can see here, is retracted posteriorly. And this is very important because if you have two layers of tissue like this, the deep layer and the superficial layer, it means that you have to take into consideration the different direction of retraction and the different a different amount of retraction of the two uh, layers. So what is the impact of this uh, tendon delamination of tendon healing? We made a study that we published last year in the American Journal of Sports Medicine, where we, tr we tried to uh, look at the effect of tendon delamination of uh, rotator cuff tendon healing. And as you can see in this series of patients, we just put an anchor lateral here and we take the two layers together to make what we call the tension band repair. And this was supraspinatus tears with infraspinatus tears at sometimes and partial tear of the subscapularis. And what we did is that we look at the follow-up uh, two years with ultrasound and clinical evaluation. And you can see that there are 117 uh, arthroscopic cuff repair. Mean age of the patient is 60 years mainly 50-50 uh, 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 men and women. And this is a preoperative uh, parameters. You can see that uh, there were some small tears, some medium tears and some large tears in this series. And uh, of course, there were some tears what, that were delaminated with a deep layer, which was usually thicker and more retracted posterior medially than the superficial layer. And what we found is that the more retraction you have, the more tendon delamination you can observe from 15% in the small tear to 35% in the medium tear to 38%, about 40% in the large tears. And in these 117 uh, patients, we were able to, to, to make the difference between two groups. 
which were comparable in terms of age, gender, and uh, preoperative scores. There were 40, 80, year, 80 lesions and 80 cuff tears that were not delaminated, and 37 uh, tendon tears that were uh, with the delamination of the tendons. So we saw the patients two years after the surgery, and we made a, a evaluation of their function, but shoulder function, but also evaluation of their uh, footprint coverage. We found that in 71 person, the uh, footprint was completely covered. In 22 person, it was partially covered, but with a tendon that was smaller than normal. And in seven person, we have no coverage of the footprints, which means uh, uh, a, a tendon tear, re tear. So we were very severe, as you can see, because we consider that even a partial tear, partial footprint coverage corresponds to the non-healing of the, of the tendon. Overall, the rate of healing was 71%, 78% for delaminated tear, and 57% when the tendon were delaminated. We found that uh, the small, in the small tear, there was no difference in tendon healing between delaminated, delaminated and non-delaminated tears. In the median tears, there was a slight difference, but this was not statistically different. And in the large share, it was really statistically different. As you can see, 83% of healing versus 48% of healing when the curve was delaminated. Uh, the, the patients were happy in the majority of the cases. You see 95% of patients satisfied and a very good constant score. And there was no impact of the healing on the, on the on the functional result. However, we found that in this series of simple road uh, repair, delamination of the tendon was a negative prognostic factor for healing. And uh, the delamination was uh, uh, worse when there were more retraction, but it has no impact on the functional result. So what this study has changed into my surgical practice, this is what I would like to share with you now. In fact, uh, we published in 2005, so 15 years ago, this very simple technique, which is called the, the, the tension band repair. And we found that with this technique, and it was in our early uh, experience, you see, we had an overall rate of tendon healing of 75%. However, when it was a small tear, the rate of healing was 100%. So all calf tears, small tears healed with this technique. And it's a very simple technique. You see, you put an anchor lateral, you make a tension band repair, and you just bring everything on the footprint here, and it heals. This is a, an example here to show you uh, with a video how we do this uh, uh, technique here. It's a pretty uh, stage two tear here. We take a grasper here. We have make a release, of course. We use a, a simple hook, you know. We have tried all kind of uh, grasper of um, of uh, forceps to pass the suture, but we still prefer the, the hook because it's very simple and it allows to make a, a reverse mattress uh, a tear. And when you do this, you can pass a PDS, use it as a shuttle, and you can bring the, the tendon on the footprint and the reverse mattress suture, in fact, apply the tendon against the abraded uh, footprint. I think it's very important to get bone bleeding you need really to have a, a bone bleeding because you have the growth factors that will come from the bone because as you know the tendon itself is very poorly vascularized. With the hook you can go at the junction between the muscle and the tendon which means where the, the tendon is really good and you can do this reverse mattress uh, configuration uh, passage of the suture and using uh, uh, anchors here and sutures you can bring the tendon all together and it's very anatomic. You see here, you have four tension band sutures. And with this technique, in small and medium tears, we had about 100% of tendon healing. So it's still a, 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 a technique that I use, and I will show you this in a minute. So then I moved to the uh, double row technique and to the transosseous equivalent uh, repairs, which is called the suture bridge, which is the most popular uh, curve repair, I think. But I stopped doing this uh, kind of uh, repair and I will tell you why. 
because I observed some medial necrosis of the tendon, not only from myself, but from colleagues. And I see many, many patients now that have this kind of retear where you cannot do anything. I mean, it's, it's gone here, but not only it's gone, the muscle becomes fatty infiltrated, which means this technique, when it fails, it burns the bridge. And that's for me a problem. Because with the necrosis of the tendon here, you have retraction of the muscle and you have fatty inf infiltration of the muscle. So it means that there is no way that you can solve the, the situation afterward. So that's why I moved to uh, a different kind of repair. I quit doing this suture bridge repair and I do what I call the double layer repair. Because if you follow the Japanese works, uh, anatomical works, and you understand that there are two layers of tissue, a deep layer and a superficial layer, and you realize there is different location for these two layers. There is also different location for the reinsertion of these two layers. And Sugaya, Hiro Sugaya was the first to uh, um, show us this uh, uh, concept here where you have the deep layer that should be fixed first medially here and the superficial layer, which is fixed then laterally afterward to cover the footprint. So this is an example here of a tear where you have a, a delamination of the tendon. You see, I put an anchor just medial to the, car, uh, just the lateral to the, the cartilage, uh, just uh, posterior to the groove. You don't have to, to put two anchors. One anchor is enough. And with these anchors, you're gonna do a, a loop uh, suture here. And you have two sutures, so you can uh, put the uh, suture deep inside the joint and uh, using a clever hook you're going to take the deep layer of tissue and you make a, a, a loop like this and you're going to see it's very funny because once you're going to reduce the deep layer there will be no more tension on your on your cuff repair all all is done now you have the deep layer with one anchor here and all you have to do now is to add the tension band for the uh, superficial layer, again, using a PDS as a shuttle, you can pass your suture from the anchor through the tendon with a reverse matrix configuration. And you can use the tying, uh, you can tie knots or you can use uh, uh, knotless anchors. But I mean, the, the results in the end, at the end is the same. You have a low tension repair and you have an anatomic repair and you have a well-balanced repair. Mechanically, it's very different from what I was doing when I was doing the suture bridge. And you see here the acromioplasty and the, the impingement is gone. So it means that if the two layers have different uh, a retraction, direction of retraction, different amount of retraction, you should repair these two layers separately to have a balanced repair and an anatomic repair. So there are different techniques. The double row is not the same that the double layer. This is what I do today. I do the double layer, the layer repair. It's very different. You see here, it's very logical. It's mechanically and anatomically very sounded because you have different kind of retraction, different di di direction of retraction and different uh, reinsertion. So let's come to the uh, take home messages. Tendon delamination has been uh, underestimated, I think, because the rate can be up to 70% in chronic cuff tears. And of course, the delamination is increasing with the tear size, but this has a negative prognostic factor for tendon healing in case of simple row repair. If you, have, if you understood that there are different degree and different di direction of retraction of the two tendons, means that there is a medial infraspinatus, but there is a posterior medial retraction of the infraspinatus together with the capsule. It means that you should have a, a different a repair. You should have a separate repair for the two layers. And this is a more important uh, 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 slide, I think. You can see the infraspinatus coming very far anterior on the footprint here, and which means when it retracts, it retracts posterior and medial while the supraspinatus is more superficial and retracts medially. And my indications are very clear today. If it's a stage one or two, 
uh, retracted tear with no delamination or a small delamination. I just do a, a tension band repair like this with an anchor lateral, a reverse mattress, and this works very well. I mean, I published this film 15 years ago. It's 100 percent tendon healing. Why should I do something else? Why should I lose time in the OR with double row repair? Why should I, I, we, we, I should waste money uh, with a double row repair if I have 100 percent uh, tendon healing in this configuration? It's difficult to do more than 100 percent healing, of course. Now, if it's a larger tear, stage two or three a retracted tear, and there is a big delamination of supra and infraspinal two tear, what I do is the double layer. I have quit the, doing the, the suture bridge. And the reason I do this is because I, I have observed too many problems with the double row repair, with the suture bridge repair, with necrosis medially, and moreover, more importantly, fat infiltration, atrophy of the muscle, upward migration of the head, and no way to, to be able to solve this with a conservative surgery. Now you have to go for the, for the reverse prosthesis. And if it's a young patient, 50 years old, I think it's not fair to have uh, such a surgery that burns the bridge. This is another video that I would like to show you uh, because it's, it's interesting to see that uh, uh, the, the, sometimes the, the, the configuration of the cuff tear is not uh, as simple as it looks, you know. Uh, it looks like you can do uh, uh, suture bridge in every patient, but that's not true. Here is my portal, anteromedial, anterolateral, lateral, and posterior. Okay, posterior is the Grand Canyon view. It's in the axis of the supraspinatus. It's higher, a little higher than the anterolateral and anteromedial. You can see that uh, when I know that there is a cuff tear, I enter directly lateral. I have no reason to go posterior. I go directly lateral. And this is a very complex tear, as you will see in a moment here. You can see the area of impeachment. And uh, uh, I, for me, the, uh, there is no discussion possible. I need to do an acromioplasty in this case. But you see the retraction of the tear in this case is very complex. Look at that. And you can see that again, the patient now is coming to surgery because of the, of the biceps pathology and we need to do a biceps uh, tenodesis. So we can do it very simply here by do, putting an anchor in the groove here, by placing uh, a suture around the tendon of the biceps here with the hook, you see. You're gonna catch the two sutures together the white and the blue suture, you're gonna make two loops and you can very easily make a tenodesis. All you have to do is to, to make flexion, to put flexion of the, of the shoulder so that you relax the anterior deltoid and you get access to the anterior part of the, of the glenoid, of the humerus, I'm sorry. <coughs> so you tie knots here and you've done the uh, bicep tenodesis always with the elbow extended. Now you can concentrate on removing the biceps tendon itself. This is a, a very easy step. So you remove the piece of a tendon. And now you have to concentrate on the release of the cuff. And you should do a capsulotomy, a superior capsulotomy. You, sh you should isolate it, the uh, base of the coracoid process. Uh, now, I have no room in this shoulder. I need to do the acromioplasty now. And I do exactly like uh, Usama show us, I do it from posterior, from posterior to anterior, because it's a cutting uh, block technique. You don't have to worry, you have a flat acromion. Now I need to release the cuff superficially from the base of the coracoid, as you can see here. This is like a mooring pile. The, 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 the base of the coracoid is a mooring pile and the coracohumeral is like the cord and the supraspinatus is the boat. You have to cut the cord from the mooring pile if you want that the boat, boat goes on the ocean. Now you can put an anchor immediately close to the cartilage here, and you can do your first uh, row, which is the first layer. We, we, you're gonna take the deep layer here, you see, I'm taking only the deep layer. I bring the suture inside the joint here, and I'm gonna make a loop to repair the cuff, the, the, the deep layer here, as you can see. I take the opposite strands. Um, it's different from Laurent. Laurent Lafosse, who is taking the same uh, uh, strand of suture. I take the opposite one 
because in my hand I think it works better to bring the tissue in the in the in the right spot here. That is this is the right suture that I take here. So I have two loops. I can start to do to manage the knot tying uh, process here. Again, you can see that very easily you can bring the deep layer close to the margin of the cartilage with these two uh, suture loops. Now, in this case, it's an L-shaped uh, tendon retraction. And what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna do a lateral lateral suture before I do the superficial repair. And I want to put my knot under the cuff. So that's why I, I pass a suture posteriorly in the infraspinatus. And now I take this suture, it's a PDS, I like PDS, I, it's a good suture. Many people don't like it, I like it. And I'm gonna bring the, the suture put, uh, on the inferior surface of the, of the cuff here. I take my two strands of sutures and I can tie, tie my knots here. And you see that with this lateral lateral suture, almost everything is done. With the deep layer and the lateral lateral suture, everything is done. So all I have to do now is to, do, to put my lateral anchor about one centimeter below the footprint, close to the groove, because this is where the hard bone is. And here I use a, a, a threaded uh, anchors here. And in these anchors, I have uh, three uh, sutures. So I, can, I, I'm, I will be able to do three tension band uh, uh, sutures. Once again, I use the hook. I go very medial at the margin between the tendon and the, and, and the, and the muscle itself. I can use this PDS as a shuttle and I can bring my first suture inside the joint here and make my first tension band uh, repair. As you can see, it's very simple, it's very reproducible. All, all my fellows learned how to do that. The blue suture here, and we put the knot down on the humeral side, not on the tendon side. Because I think it's very important to respect what, what uh, Madsen Rick Madsen has described, which is the principle of smoothness. You don't want to have any knots on the uh, superficial surface of the, of the cuff tendon. You want to have just nothing, just a smooth surface. And this is why we put the knot, we tie the knot down on the humerus lateral, as you can see here. And here we can find, finally uh, uh, make the last uh, tension uh, band uh, repair here. And this is a complete uh, coverage of the, of the footprint here, as you can see here. So it's very simple to, to manage, it's very reproducible. And as you can see here, now do you have the rotator interval here that we leave open? It's very important to leave it open. You will have no uh, frozen shoulder after that. You can see the base of the coracoid, you can see the supraspinatus, you can see the infraspinatus. It was a pretty complex tear. This is why I wanted to show you that, uh, this case here. Because with this deep, uh, with this uh, double layer repair, you can do a very nice repair, which is not under tension and which is very uh, accurately uh, repaired. And this is the, the uh, MRI after six months. You can see the perfect healing of the two layers of tissue here with the two uh, anchors here. Again, here is a balance and it's an anatomical repair. This is why I moved to this kind of repair. Finally, I would like to emphasize that the fact that what has been shown by David Sonaben from Australia many years ago is that to get a real insertion of the tendon to the bone, you need to have sharpie fibers. And this takes 15, 15 weeks. He has operated on monkeys. He has done a histologic study. It takes 15 weeks. So it's more than three months. If you don't protect your patients if you don't protect those shoulders where you then attend and repair for three months, you're gonna compromise the repair, whatever the nice repair you have done. So it's important to protect the repair. And for personally, I ask my patients to make a break in their life of three months where they cannot do sports, they cannot work, because I know that it is the delay, the time, it is the time which is needed to have complete insertion, complete uh, fi sharpie fibers to hold the tendon to the bone. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, invite you to join us on the July 9, 11. Thank you for your attention.